In this video, we're gonna break down what causes ptosis and how it impacts your vision. The most effective surgical techniques, both the internal and external methods. Who is a good candidate for each method? Before and after examples that show real-time results. I'm Dr. Zumalan, I'm a board-certified ocular plastic surgeon, and today I'm gonna to talk to you about ptosis repair and how I can help my patients look more refreshed and alert. And make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel to learn more about my expert tips and recommendations for plastic surgery and facial aesthetics. Do your eyelids feel heavy? Do you feel like you're always straining your forehead to see better? Do you feel like you're constantly asked why you're tired even though you're not? When you look in the mirror, do you feel like one eye looks a little bit lower than the other or both may actually look low and make you look sleepy when you're actually not? If so, these all could be consistent with having eyelid ptosis. Eyelid ptosis can occur from many causes and what happens is that the eyelid muscle gets stretched out and or weakened and so it doesn't function that well and it rests a little bit lower than it should be. There can be cases of congenital ptosis where somebody's born with having a droopy eyelid. There can be cases of acquired ptosis where it occurs through age or it can happen through trauma like a, a repeated infection or swelling of the eyelid that causes that eyelid to stretch with time. It can happen with repeated intraocular surgeries as well. It can also happen with prolonged use of contact lenses. Although not everybody that uses contact lenses ends up with ptosis, there is some associations. There's various causes of ptosis and there's other kinds of ptosis that are more like neurogenic related or muscular neurogenic related. So it's important to see an oculoplastic surgeon or an ophthalmologist when you're uh, initially concerned about having ptosis. And then my job comes into play to help those that require that weakened muscle to be tightened and lifted so that patient's eyelid position can be improved and that ptosis can be repaired. Ptosis is not just a cosmetic problem, it's actually a reconstructive problem as well. A lot of patients that I see that end up desiring to have cosmetic eyelid surgery, such as a blepharoplasty, such as an endoscopic brow lift, lower eyelid blepharoplasty, are also not aware their symptoms of feeling tired or looking aged largely can come from having ptosis that they did not even know about. So it's fairly common in my practice to perform an upper eyelid uh, blepharoplasty along with a ptosis, what I call a combination procedure in that particular case. So I'm not only rejuvenating the upper eyelid by removing the extra skin, but I'm also elevating that droopy eyelid. It's a combination of a cosmetic and a reconstructive surgery. Ptosis surgery is a beautiful, elegant procedure. It's a procedure that I've spent countless years working on as an oculoplastic surgeon, perfecting my skills. As an oculoplastic surgeon, I have the benefit and knowledge of understanding how to maintain the health of the eye while performing plastic surgery around the eye. The good news is that ptosis is correctable. It has to be significant enough though. So the most important thing is that Patients should contact me if they're considering having a ptosis repair. If they've been diagnosed with ptosis or they know that they have ptosis, contact our office. I'll review your photographs and then at that time feel that if the ptosis is significant enough, I'll have you come meet with me in person and then we'll have a formal consultation to make sure that truly is ptosis, that truly is a ptosis that I can correct, and then, then we'll discuss options. There's not just one type of ptosis surgery for everybody. There's several different types of ptosis repairs although I generally perform one more so than the others, it all depends on the severity of the ptosis and how weak the muscle is. Most patients that see me usually have what I described as an acquired ptosis, which has happened through time. And so the ptosis is mild to moderate. So the droop is perhaps about two millimeters lower than it should be, somewhere in that range. So in that particular case, if the muscle is somewhat healthy, able to function, but it's low, then I can perform an internal approach. An internal approach is also termed as a posterior approach where the incision is actually made from the inside of the eyelid. So there technically is not a visible outer eyelid incision when I perform an inner uh, ptosis approach procedure. It's beautiful. So patients will not know they have a procedure done later on as everything is healed. All the work is done from the inside. This procedure can be done while you're awake under local, or with some sedation in the operating room. It can be a little bit uncomfortable in the lo uh, under local, but it depends on the patient's goals and how comfortable they are, and we'll discuss that in person in our consultation. Um, the internal approach, there's various different types of techniques, but the most common one involves tightening a Mueller muscle, Mueller, it's called the Mueller muscle conjunctival resection, MMCR. 
I perform that in addition to, at times, removing a little bit of additional tissue. When it comes to the interior uh, approach, what it involves is tightening the muscle from the inside. It's a, the Mueller muscle. It's a, it's a very, very thin anatomical structure on the back side of the eyelid that we're able to tighten through that interior approach. And there's various specialized techniques that we do when we're tightening this, this particular muscle through this interior approach to allow for the eyelid to come up. One of the beautiful things that I offer for my patients is that after I perform this internal approach, when they see me for their post-op exam one week later, I carefully take out that suture from the outside and then I can gently adjust the eyelid if I need to. The reason being that TOSA surgery is such a delicate procedure that when you're doing both eyes, especially with one eye lower than the other, there's often some potential asymmetry that can still exist after the surgery. And so what I'm able to do is adjust the eyelids even at the one week out to really make them as perfect as possible. This is an advantage to the technique that I do. And it's something that I've learned you know, through my fellowship you know, almost 17 years ago. But, but that allowed, allows for the patients to get the best outcome as possible. You know, we generally strive for perfection in the operating room, but sometimes there, it could be off by half a millimeter or even, even less. And so by adjusting it in, in the office one week later, I'm able to allow for that eyelid recovery to be, for that, I'm, allowed, I'm allowing for that eyelid result to look as, as amazing as possible. You know, another approach that I do is in contrast to an internal approach is an external approach. So the incision is made from the outside. And those procedures are generally reserved for patients that have really severe ptosis, like more than two millimeters of a difference between the other eyelid maybe three millimeters, maybe four millimeters. There's only so much lift that you can get from an internal approach. From an external approach, you're able to get a much higher lift. I like to reserve the external approach for those that have a very severe ptosis that I'm able to lift from the outside approach. The differences between the two are that naturally you're gonna have an external incision that heals similar to a blepharoplasty incision. I also need a little bit more patient cooperation during a surgery because I need to see how much I need to tighten that muscle while the patient's awake. So there's a little bit more challenges involved through an external approach. It's a beautiful, elegant approach to addressing ptosis. I consider in those more severe cases compared to an internal approach. That particular procedure will either be done under local as well or under some mild sedation, but I still need the patient awake and cooperative during that exam. So that's the difference between that internal approach where I really don't need the patient's cooperation for an internal approach. They can just be relaxed as they need to. I already know the set measurements of how much I need to tighten the muscle. Third type of uh, ptosis surgery is largely reserved for very severe cases of ptosis where patients also have a very weak eyelid muscle that going from the internal approach or going from the external approach is not going to help because those muscles are already so weak that you're not able to elevate to where you need to. So at that point, you need to utilize other muscles. So it's this procedure is called a frontalis sling procedure where you actually use the frontalis muscle. So what's interesting is when patients have ptosis, one of the telltale signs of ptosis is that that one particular eyebrow is higher than the other side if one person, well, that patient has a ptosis, let's say in just one eye. So the eyebrow tends to be raised higher. Why? Because naturally, if your eyebrow is raised higher, you're able to lift the eyelid because the frontalis muscle is able to gently, sl slightly lift up that eyelid as well. Knowing that knowledge, utilizing that, we're able to make small incisions above the eyebrow, engage in this frontalis muscle, which is this large band of muscle right you know, above the eyebrows, engage in those muscles through some sutures, it could be a, a silicone sling, it could be a, a permanent suture that you place from these incisions that grab this frontalis muscle, and then you're essentially ap applying this sling to go down into the lower eyelid. It's a very um, advanced technique that I was trained during my fellowship, and it's reserved largely for those that have very severe ptosis. And in my particular practice, I don't see that type of severe ptosis as much as I see the more mild to moderate ptosis. Uh, procedures that I just mentioned through an internal approach or external approach. Droopy eyelids don't just affect how you look, they also affect how you see the world. If ptosis is making everyday tasks harder, don't ignore it. If you're considering ptosis repair, please reach out. I'm happy to meet with you and discuss options that would help you best, whether it's internal method, external method. This is what I'm here for as an expert. Look forward to meeting with you. Have more questions, drop them in the comments. And make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel to learn more about my expert tips and recommendations for plastic surgery and facial aesthetics.